So I'm an intern at the Autistic Self Advocacy Network. As such, um, I have a few special interests. Um, specifically, my special interests are um, transhumanist culture, disability culture, how these two uh, have similarities, and basically how to get people to do things that they dream of. <coughs> a lot of among the communities that I'm in, uh, transhumanist culture, rationalist culture, uh, maybe some subcultures like furry culture, um, etc. I see a lot of people having big dreams. I see a lot of people uh, having ideas about what they want to be in the future, what they want to be now. Um, and that's great. I think our society is one that is deficient in dreams. And I'm so happy that I have fallen in among the dreamers. Mm -hmm. What I don't see very often is people who know how to turn those dreams into reality. I know a lot of people who have ideas and then believe they have to implement them in the most perfect possible way. And if they don't do everything exactly right, then they might as well not do anything at all. Um, and I think this is a really an unfortunate attitude. Uh, so I'm going to be asking some questions here. Um, what does it mean to have a dream? What does it mean to have a dream that's weirder than the dreams everybody in society seems to think you should have? Um, how do you get from having an idea to having the courage and the means and the community support necessary to build that? Um, and this is all very abstract, so I'll try to give you some concrete examples. Uh, WTF is transhumanism. I see a lot of answers to that. Um, in the uh, more central transhumanist culture, I'm talking about like H+, I'm talking about uh, Extreme Future Fest, uh, the people that live in Silicon Valley. Um, I see a lot of transhumanism, somewhat like furry culture, actually is based very strongly in a fictional canon or core set of books, um, ideas, fictional supplements, uh, science fiction, like Verna Vinge type stuff, uh, nanobots, the future, Grey Goo, Uplift. Um, <laughs> When will we all be uploads? Um, which is what I see most transhumanists talking about. By most transhumanists, I mean the most visible transhumanists. Um, this is all very interesting and thrilling. And far be it for me to say that science fiction is not kind of the coolest thing ever. Um, but I also see these people defining transhumanism very broadly and confidently as like, we are the future thinkers, we are the dreamers, we are the people who dare to imagine that human bodies can do more and better. Like, tons of people do that, right? Uh, there's this thing called confirmation bias, some of you may be familiar with it. If I say, all cubes are red, cubes are the most red thing, there are not things redder than cubes, and cubes are generally like the epitome of redness. It's for, for more abstract examples, for ones that you don't look at and be like, what, now, now I see a big cube over there, what are you getting? Uh, it's often hard to think outside, if you'll pardon me, rather inexcusable pun, the box. Um, <laughs> so what I'm getting at it here is that transhumanists are transhumanists, <laughs> but so are a lot of other cultures, a lot of other people. Um, what are some examples of this? People who have giant, dreaming, sci-fi ideas and want to implement them. Uh, transhumanist starts with a prefix. The prefix, you know, the prefix is trans. I think we know some trans people who, uh, um, transgender cultures, um, trans with the asterisk, um, is one of the cultures that I've seen that is best at both holding this idea of I have a body, it is different from the body I might want to have, or I have a gender, it is incongruous with the social inputs I receive, and I wish to change something to make that happen. I'm not necessarily talking about um, surgery or hormones, although these are the examples that most commonly get bandied about. I'm talking about pronoun changing, uh, talking about um, modifying the way that the world perceives and interacts with you based on a dream that you have for how you would want to be interacted with. 
Now that's great. In a society that is telling someone like me, for example, that I must not only be female physically, that is if I have traits that are not canonically female, that are not standard to the central example of females, um, that I should want to modify that, I should want bigger boobs, I should want a nicer voice, I should want longer hair, all these things. Um, I am in a society that tells me that I should cooperate with being perceived as socially the central example of femininity. Um, and it's very easy, because of confirmation bias, when the whole world is telling you, be something, to not imagine that you could be something else, or to imagine it, but not hear that voice inside yourself and fold parts of yourself away. <laughs> No, 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 I talked for minutes, right? I didn't talk for 20 minutes. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. That was good, though. We just okay. Like that thought. It's okay. We had to get it out somewhere. We can always use the time for more for questions. Don't worry about it. Okay. Um, more examples. Body modification culture. Uh, things. There are some people that get magnets implanted in their fingertips so that they can sense electromagnetic fields. I think that's the raddest fucking thing ever. <laughs> Sorry, this is a derated panel. <laughs> that's You'll the raddest fucking thing ever. <laughs> um, Another trend to the surface. Fracking Tattoos. I'm sure the furry culture gets, uh, gets like, like, who was it? Like, that leopard woman? Got all these body molds that look like a leopard? Or lizard guy? Uh, I'm sure that furries get sort of associated with that a lot. Uh, um, animal uplift, which is on the name of this panel, um, and also a term that I have like minor semantic issues with, but maybe I'll get into that later. Um, the idea that communication barriers between us and non-human sapients is just that, a communication barrier that just because someone or something isn't, we don't notice them talking to us, doesn't mean they're not talking, and doesn't mean that we might not learn to hear them. Um, which brings me to my next point, disability. Um, transition, oh, how do I do that? Um, so disability culture um, has been in the media's attention <laughs> since, I think, the 60s, as many things. Um, as far as I know, disability rights and advocacy for sort of architectural or structural um, accommodations for people in wheelchairs started very <coughs> in Pasadena. Um, a student at Caltech who had had polio as a child had, and was in a wheelchair, and managed to get into school despite, no doubt, the uh, many barriers he faced, not only in, learn in like perceiving information and in taking it, but also in uh, social barriers, people who thought he couldn't, people who thought it would be impossible to teach him, impossible to integrate him in a classroom, impossible to for him to get to college and take care of himself on a campus. Um, I think our society has a very poorly thought through fetish for self-sufficiency. We think that independence is the highest goal, that we can't rely on anyone else, that we can't be enslaved to another person. Um, I think that this is a great ideal that is constructed extremely poorly in our society, in that, okay, right, contents of my pockets over there, um, cell phone, cell phone made in China, parts from all over the place, metals probably from a different country, um, constructed by tons and tons and tons of different people, someone made the microchip, someone made the screen, someone made the case, uh, someone built the software, and 
then my boyfriend bought it for me for two hundred dollars. But I'm independent. <laughs> yes. Um, wallet, right? Um, without this piece of plastic that I bought for sixty dollars from the government, I could not be here because, as you may or may not have noticed, I do not exactly look my age, which is eighteen. Mm -hmm. um, they wouldn't have let me in. Well, they would, but you wouldn't be able to go to the late night panels. Not that, that necessarily no, matters at this uh, level. To get this badge, which mm -hmm. I had to have to get to the panels, I had to show my ID to prove that I was the same person that I am playing with. Well, mm -hmm. I'm just saying they would put a little marker on it and then you would not be able to go into the yeah, adult content. They, don't they, they, who you they are. wouldn't let me have the name. Uh, because yeah, the name belongs to the piece of plastic. My name belongs to this piece of plastic. Once I lost my wallet, it was so fucking creepy. I went through TSA, they swabbed my shoes for book. <laughs> tangent, tangent. <laughs> Moving on. Society with a fetish for independency, or for feeling independent, for feeling like you don't have to rely on another human being to get through your day. The fact is, we all rely on billions of human beings to get through our day. Uh, if any of you has read the essay, which I really wish I could link or hand out, uh, called I Pencil. It goes over this a bit. Um, yeah. What I'm getting at here is humans know how to be paranoid of other humans. They know how to be paranoid of small type conspiracies that are cackling evilly in their offices going, yes, yes, we will hurt poor people. Yes, yes, we will hurt minorities. Yes, we love doing that. Uh, people don't know how to be paranoid of bureaucracies, of systems that because of centuries of historical oppression just naturally fall into the old ways. They don't know how to hate and fear systems that are doing the same thing they have always done just because it's the dumb thing. Why should we change opportunity cost? Um, so... <coughs> So similarly to this, in our society we are very afraid of being dependent on other people, but do not perceive it as frightening that we are dependent on millions and millions of them. Um, which brings me to disability. Disabled people, people who are physically or mentally impaired and perceived as impaired by our society, um, often make use of aids, accommodations and supports to do the tasks that they need and want to do in their daily life, activities of daily living. Um, somebody who doesn't have legs might need a friend to help lift them into their wheelchair in the morning or to help them bathe. Somebody who has, uh, like, particularly impairing ADD might need a friend to say, hey, have you eaten lunch today? Mm -hmm. uh, somebody, I was reading an essay about this woman earlier, but for the life of me, I can't Aid to remind me. Um, Which one is it? Um, she talked to a famous American eugenicist. Um, is it a wheelchair? Is it a baby? Mm -hmm. Whatever. Um, somebody who has weakness in their arms might need a friend to help them prop up their arm to feed themselves. Right? Uh, and we are irrationally terrified of this. We're like, oh my god, if I had to depend on someone to eat. Would my life be worth living? There's a paper put out by the University of Hawaii that shows that non-disabled people or people who do not have the specific kind of disability they're thinking about often uh, drastically underestimate people with those dis disabilities' quality of life. They go, oh my god, if I was in that situation, I'd want to kill myself. Mm -hmm. Because they can't imagine getting used to it, even though they're used to the same situation magnified astronomically in their everyday life. Because it's different, it is scary. Um, this has to do with what, uh, what in disability specifically is called the medical versus the social model. And in general culture, um, by general culture, I mean academic culture, is known as uh, descriptive, normative versus descriptive models. Uh, the medical model of disability says uh, you are less than a human in some way. Uh, we don't mean that rudely, but you have an impairment that makes you less capable than other humans, right? It's just obvious. 
So we, with our pills and our surgery and our prosthetics and our therapy, will make you more like a human. Because then you can do things that humans do and you will be happy. Um, and if this is not used oppressively, it can be helpful for some people. I don't need to straw man the medical model. It has its uses. Um, but what I think is a more comprehensive and productive model of disability is the social model, which says people have impairments. We all have impairments. Everybody in this room is impaired. A thousand, thousand, thousand ways. I can't fly. I think that's kind of fucked up. I have <laughs> dreams sometimes about flying, and it is the best feeling in the world. If I could have wings, my life would be so much better. Ugh. If I could swim, like, okay, geek time, uh, World of Warcraft, I always play a druid, because when you're a druid, you can shapeshift into, like, a manatee, and swim around in the oceans, and sometimes I just, like, swim around for hours, like, yeah, I'm a manatee. Uh, <laughs> I love that feeling. If I could swim for hours and hours without needing to breathe, that would be incredible, but I can't, because I'm impaired. Um, I also have autism. What this means in terms of anticipated experience is that I have trouble recognizing people's faces. I have trouble, sometimes in the morning I wake up and can't remember how to get out of bed. Sometimes I go through my day doing work for my various jobs and at the end of the day I realize that I have forgotten to eat because I can't remember how. Sometimes I go for days and days and days without remembering to shower because showering has all of these steps, right? For most people, it's like, go to the bathroom, get in the shower, turn on shower, shower, wash yourself, get out dry. For me, there are tons more steps. I could list them all out, but that would take around 20 minutes. And remembering all of those steps is exhausting for me. Um, An example? Sometimes in the morning, I have the choice of pouring a bowl of cereal versus frying an egg and, make, and putting it on toast. Even though it's the more complex process, I will go for the egg and toast because I have an easier time remembering all of the processes for cooking an egg and making the toast than simply getting the bowl out, opening the fridge, and pouring the milk in the soup. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great example. Um, and when I say I have autism, I don't mean that I have a special, magical, different kind of experience that nobody ever has. I'm sure some of y'all have been too lazy to get in the shower sometimes. Uh, I, and I don't use the term lazy pejoratively. I think lazy really does mean too tired, too confused, too out of cope to get something done. Or to feel like you can get something done. Uh, when I say I have autism, what I mean is that my experience with this is... I have tried all my life. You can believe that I have not tried, and I am just lazy, and therefore not really disabled. Um, this is what people have told me for most of my life, because when I try, I can appear more typical. But trying is exhausting. Mm -hmm. Trying drains me. When I try, I'm out of energy to care for the people I love and to do the things I like and to give myself the care that I need. And most people think that's a worthwhile cause. Most people think children should be seen and not heard. Most people think in our society that it is better to go through a nine to five job, hurt yourself, hate yourself, hate your job, go back home, drink, smoke, cut yourself. Do whatever you do to get through the day, but do it quietly. Do it so that you're not hurt. Do it so that you don't have to look freaky. And I think that's fucked. Sorry. Um, Descriptive versus normative. Normative says, you're too different, be like the normal thing. Descriptive says, you have these traits. Okay, what do you want to do with them? What do you want to have, uh, what other traits do you want to have? Uh, what are your goals? 
I think that's better. Um, the normative model is very useful if you live in a tribe of 200 and if somebody is too weird, they get eaten by a lion, but there are no more lions except the lovely ones that are in this room right now. Um, <laughs> and <coughs> a lot of people see that, hate that, and react by dreaming. React by dreaming big, dreaming of being somebody that is different from normal. Uh, too few people feel like they are allowed to try, allowed to actually do allowed to stop imagining themselves as an animal and so the costume. Uh, allowed to ask to be called by a different pronoun. Allowed to say, I don't like talking out loud. I prefer to type. Um, my dream is for a world in which people feel alive.